All right, ladies and gentlemen, today we have a uh, treat especial, as uh, AVE would say. Um, today we're going to do a quick overview, a little bit of review of the uh, Behringer XR12. This is a 12 channel digital mixer. Um, as you can see, pretty small form factor. Uh, I mean, here's my hand on top of it here. It's not that big, not that wide, very easy to move, very portable. Um, I am recording this audio through the unit, so you'll be able to hear me work with it here in a bit. Um, but for right now, uh, we'll go over some of the features. So the first thing that you notice about this mixer is there is no control surface to this. This is a mixer that is completely controlled via a app, uh, either on a PC, Mac, Linux, or it can also be controlled with an iPad app, uh, Android app as well. Um, to connect to this, to be able to control it, this has a three position, or, uh, sorry, three mode Wi-Fi router built into it uh, with both a hardwired ethernet jack, a built-in Wi-Fi router, or an access point. Um, the access point does contain a DHCP server, so you can connect directly to this via the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi antenna is right here. Um, you can connect directly to it, so you, it doesn't require an external, external router to be able to use it. Uh, for the sake of this demonstration today, I am hooking it directly to my, my network here, so I can show you guys a screen capture here on my desktop. If the desktop had a wireless card on it, I'd just connect it via wireless, but it doesn't, so that's why I'm doing this. It also has Wi-Fi client mode, which is the third mode. So you can take this unit and connect it to an existing Wi-Fi network via Wi-Fi. Um, so for example, if I already had a Wi-Fi network at a venue that I knew the password to and so forth like that, I can set that up inside the mixer itself with the app. Now, mind you, you do have to connect to it via access point mode first to be able to configure that. But for um, a, a venue or say you already have a wireless router in a rack or something like that at, a, at an event, uh, you can put it in Wi-Fi client mode, it will then connect to your wireless router and then you can connect to it via that network. Um, along the front here it does have MIDI in and out. I've not used that myself personally, but you can control each of the inputs, uh, volume levels, things like that via MIDI. Um, that's something I will eventually get into, I haven't gotten into it yet. But, uh, so I can't really speak for what all control you can get with the MIDI. It does have a USB style B port on the front of it. Uh, we'll get into that here in a little bit as well. This thing can record. Uh, it's a two channel recorder, so it can record either like the main out, left, right. It can record uh, two individual inputs uh, as a left, right. Um, or you can you record like both aux outs if you want to as well. Um, does have a headphone jack on it with its own level. This is assignable. You can choose the uh, pickoff point. Uh, you can monitor an individual channel or you can monitor the main out. You can monitor an aux out, uh, something like that. Um, the first four inputs, these are TRS XLR combo jacks. Um, so you can use a, a TRS balanced input on these. The first four have the Midas preamps in them. Uh, the Midas pre's are excellent little preamps. Um, they are full mic level pre's. They also have phantom power uh, able in the first four as well. Uh, five through 10, those are just standard TRS balanced inputs uh, for standard line in applications. Personally, I use for my DJ setup uh, channels five and six. That is my standard DJ in from my, my controller, my mixer. Um, I use XLR to TRS adapters um, maintaining that they are balanced on both sides. Um, these are balanced inputs. Uh, you can use, if, if you use a XLR to TRS adapter for these, you can theoretically hook a microphone to these as well. Um, the only issue with that is the preamps in these are line preamps. You can crank them up high enough to get audio out of a mic with them, no problem, but they're not gonna sound as good as these first four, number one, because the preamps are different, and these do not have phantom power available on them as well. Channels 11 and 12, these are line ins as well. However, these are high Z inputs. So you can hook a, for example, you can hook an electric guitar directly to uh, 11 or 12 here. Um, of course, these are still balanced as well, but they are high Z. Um, so 
you can hook a, uh, like an electric guitar directly to this. Uh, in a little bit, we'll go through the effects that are in this. The purpose of that is, say you were at a venue um, and your pedal board died or, or, or whatever issue you had, your amplifier died, for example. You can hook your electric guitar directly to this mixer here. And with some of the effects, you can process the guitar as well. So if you need a distortion, you can you can patch in a, uh, a, a guitar amp uh, simulator into one of these two. And uh, you can essentially use this as your guitar amp. It will emulate uh, a guitar amp. And then you can just output you know, either an aux or, or the main output directly to a, ma a big soundboard. And then boom, you're, you're back on. Um, Main left and right out are XLR balanced, which is very convenient and handy. Um, it also has two auxiliary outputs. These are TRS balanced auxiliary outputs. Um, these are very handle, handy for running that, maybe a monitor mix, something like that. Or in my case, using this for wedding DJing, I can run one of these aux outs. And of course, these are independent mixes. So these are completely independent mix of all these inputs as the main output and of course between themselves as well. You can stereo pair these aux outs if you want, but uh, that's just an option. So what I typically do is if I have a an awkward room, I will sometimes take one of these auxes and run that out to a separate powered speaker, maybe in a different section of the room. And because it's a whole separate mix, I don't actually have to patch the my controller, the music portion. I don't have to patch that to that output. I can just use like my mic or something like that. So I had a wedding recently where I, uh, the room was kind of separated with some with some walls and some doorways and it was kind of awkward. Um, but the far section of the room um, was in a way that I couldn't place any speakers in the main section of the room and be able to carry completely throughout this, uh, this hall uh, because of the walls and, and the doorways and stuff like that. So what I did is I put a speaker on an aux out now, this, this is a section of the room where a lot of people during the dancing, dancing portion of the night were wanting to you know, sit down and talk and stuff like that. So what I did is I took my, my microphone and just a tad bit of the music, since it was his own separate mix, tad bit of the music, and I patched that to one of the aux outs and ran that out there. So whenever I was talking on the mic, the people in this section could hear me. They could hear the introductions, they could hear everything else, but they were not being blasted out with music and stuff like that, uh, like the main section of the room uh, was. Mind you, not blasted out, but they were not, they did not hear the music near as loud, which was good for them. They really enjoyed that. They liked that. It was a good, it was a good thing. Um, other than that, it's got a standard IEC power cable on the side. Um, so you can just use any old computer uh, power cord for it. But that's pretty much it for the actual physical mixer itself. So we'll take a look here in a second um, and we'll go through the software for it. Um, but you know, this is a very compact, it does come with rack ears. Uh, I don't have them on this one because I, I keep this portable. Uh, it does have rack ears that you can rack mount this. Uh, since there is nothing on the back, there's only the power cord on the side, everything that you need is on the front. So inputs and outputs are all on the front. So it is pretty easily rack mountable and you don't have to worry about um, getting things, uh, having to reach in behind and then plug outputs in the back and stuff like that. It's all like this. Typically I'll set this on my table, uh, sometimes below my table. Um, I don't really actually need to touch any of this once I have it set up. That's the great part about being you know, controlled via network uh, with an iPad or a computer. Um, you almost always have a computer there with you at the gigs anyway. Um, so you pull up the software, you can control it completely from there. This thing can be wherever you want to in a room. So I had a wedding one time where the, uh, uh, the layout of the room was kind of awkward and I could have had this at the table where I was, but because of the runs and the auxes that I had to run at that event, it was easier for me to put this mixer uh, back behind the head table with some of my other sound gear, which is where my speakers were and stuff like that. I put this back there. I pulled up the Wi-Fi antenna. I connected to the Wi-Fi on this with my computer. I had my wireless mic ran in here and the wireless mic receiver was with this. And then I ran my you know, main outs to my, my speakers and I only had one set of cables running from my my uh, my my table with my mixer on it because my wireless receiver was up there with me well, up there with this and then five and six I had as my my mixer in so 
this can be anywhere. Uh, as long as I had a Wi-Fi signal to it, I can control it completely just like it was sitting in front of me. And it made my table a little cleaner because I didn't have as much you know, clutter, much as much things on the table. Uh, so that was, a, that was a nice touch. So let's take a look at the software here. All right, so here's the software. Uh, you can see my microphone is running in on channel one, uh, just like you, uh, you saw before. Um, this, this looks here just like a, a, standard, a standard mixer you would see anywhere. You have your volume controls along the bottom. You have mute buttons. You can mute, unmute, and so forth like that. Um, all 16 channels are here. You also have an aux, auxiliary uh, channel here as well. This auxiliary channel is specifically for the, uh, the playback from the USB on the front of the unit itself. So if you have audio files stored on that USB that you plug into the front, they will be, they will come back through on this aux channel here. Um, and on the, the far right here, you see the four uh, effects that we have here. We'll, we'll go over those effects in a minute. Um, I'm using a de -esser on my mic here, as you can tell. I also have a reverb patched in there. Uh, you can see a little bit of it showing up there when I talk loudly. And then the fourth channel is the uh, master bus compressor I have put on this. Uh, the main out. Um, as you can tell, this is a fully digital mixer. So you have a lot of control with this. You can take snapshots. Um, okay, had to change a couple things around here to to get this to, to look how I wanted it to here so you can see the other windows. So it has, you can take snapshots. So that's the first thing we're gonna talk about. So once I've gotten to a venue and I've gotten everything set up, one of the things that's really nice about this mixer is you can take a digital snapshot of everything on this. So everything from the, the levels of your mics to the EQ curves to compressor settings to effects, everything can be snapshotted, which is very handy. So I can take here, I can open up some snapshots here. I'll pull the panel here so you can see it. I have quite a few here. Um, some of the things, uh, yeah, DJ setup here is a, my standard DJ setup. I also have a setup for ceremonies. Now I'm not gonna load this because it's gonna mess up what you're you're, you're hearing me through right now. But um, for ceremonies, the first two channels I have as my lapel mics. Now those lapel mics are good mics. However, they do require a little bit of EQing to make them sound good, um, especially through a you know a system and stuff like that. Getting your lapel mic so they don't feed back and, and things like that is important for ceremony. So the first two mic, or first two channels, I know exactly what my mics sound like and I use the exact same mics and the exact same channels every time. So the first two are my lapel mics for the officiant and for the groom. Um, and of course there's an EQ curve set up for that, the compressor settings, you know, all of that is set in that snapshot. So whenever I get to a ceremony, I can double click on that ceremony snapshot it'll load it in and then I know everything is already set how I need to from then I go and I can set my levels and stuff like that because obviously levels are going to be different for speaker placement and stuff like that but the mic EQs are pretty much going to stay the same for the most part so those are kinds of things you can store with snapshots so it makes it very convenient um, of course when you do turn this turn this unit off all of the uh, settings stay exactly how it was when you turned it off. So if I just got done with a DJ gig and I turn this thing off, my next DJ gig, I can turn it back on and it'll be right back where it was. So you don't have to worry about you know, resetting everything every time. So that's the snapshots. You can choose what all is stored in the snapshot. Um, as you can see here on the right hand side, there is all kinds of different stuff that you can, you can either exempt or store. So say I didn't want to store any master outputs like my main left right or my effects i can deselect these and then it will only store the actual channel settings themselves and parameters and so forth like down through here so you can choose what you want to save every time so it makes it kind of nice um so the mixer itself you'll see we have individual channels here um this section right up here at the top is the input section this is my input gain uh we'll we'll go into this in more detail in a second when we go to the channels tab. But for right now, this is just what it looks like in the mixer. Um, you can see my EQ curve is here. The second one below here is my dynamics, my compressor. And you can see the compressor working right now if you look closely. See the red coming down. So it gives you a, a, a live feedback of what is actually happening. Pan control. And then, of course, you can name all of your channels. You can color code them as well. Uh, you can change the colors around to, to work with whatever makes sense to you. And then, of course, you can solo channels as well. Soloing can be used with the headphone jack, so you can choose to plug headphones in. You can hit the solo button. It's not going to affect the main output, 
but then what it's going to do is it's going to solo that into your headphones so you can you can hear that channel a little bit better. Um, auto mix settings are right here. I don't use auto mix. I won't go into that for this right now, but they're there. Um, and then down here at the bottom, we have our mute groups and then the mute button itself. So mute groups, you can see on the right-hand side here, are assigned either in the channel settings itself or you can actually click on them down here. And so what this will do is I can hit mute group number one. And what it's going to do is it's going to mute everything that is part of mute group one. So I'm going to unmute channel two here. And I hit this. And you can see it muted and unmuted channels one and two because they were in the same group. Uh, mute group number two is uh, three, four, five, and six here. So I'll hit number two, and then you'll see it'll mute three, four, five, and six. So you can assign this up. So if you're doing something, you can put all of your microphones on one mute group. You can hit one sorry, hit one button and then mute all of your microphones. So that can be convenient. Same with uh, if you have multiple DJ inputs and stuff like that, you can hit number two, it'll mute all of those, but leave the mics active. It can make it kind of quick. Um, so let's, the rest of this information on here is, uh, it's kind of hard to tell what is what here. Um, this section here is for the auxiliary buses. I have a little bit patched into bus or aux two. It's really hard to see from here. This is, this is kind of good to, if you want to keep like an overall watch of things, but for the most part, this is not super helpful in, in setting things up. So we'll delve into a channel here and we'll uh, we'll get into it. So first channel, I'm going to go ahead and select this channel. I can click on the, the uh, name of it here and it will select it. As you can see, it's highlighted. So I'm going to click over here on the top tab to channel. And here is a good description of the actual channel itself. Um, my channel input here, I see 48 volts phantom is turned on on this one because I am using a condenser mic. You can invert polarity. So say you have like two microphones on the snare drum and you need to invert the bottom one, you can flip the polarity of each channel itself. You can also stereo link from here. So the stereo link will attach basically, in this example, it would attach channels one and two together. It would pan channel one to the left, pan channel two to the right. We'll see that in a minute when we go into the DJ uh, input settings here. Uh, after this, you have a real basic setting on your noise gate. Um, you can turn it on and off here, and you can also adjust the threshold. That's really it, and you can see what kind of gain reduction it's doing. That's really all you can see from here. It doesn't give you a whole lot. Uh, the second one, you have the equalizer. You can enable or disable the equalizer here. I currently have a low cut put on on this. You can adjust that low cut frequency from right here, but that's pretty much it. Once again, you can turn the low cut on and off, and then you can turn the equalizer itself on and off. That's really all you can do here, but gives you kind of a, a rough uh, idea of what's going on. This window up here will show the uh, uh, the EQ curve you currently have on it. So you, you can get an idea if you have like the highs rolled off or something like that. Next one is the compressor. Uh, you can see it is active here. I am using it. I'll back the threshold off just a little bit. It'll get a little bit louder. Um, you can turn the compressor on and off from here. There's off and then turn the compressor back on. You can adjust your threshold. So I can smash it real far down here if I want to. Um, or I just bring it back up here to a decent level. Hope it's not too loud. Don't think I'm peaking. Yeah, I think we're good. Um, next one is your auxiliary bus sends. So this is what I had mentioned before with the aux one and two. This is how I can send audio to these auxiliary buses. So say auxiliary bus one, I want to have just my mic. So what I would do is I would go through all my other channels and make aux bus one down to zero because I don't want any of that channel in that aux. Then I will take my main mic and I will just put a little bit of the volume in there. So now my main mic will have uh, some of that, uh, or sorry, my auxiliary one will have some of that main mic in there. Um, the XR18, which uses the same software, I also own one of those. We'll talk. We can talk about that in another video. Um, has six auxiliary bus sends, which is the reason for these uh, other four right here. Uh, which are disabled in this. Uh, below that are your effects sends. This is how you can send some of this channel into each of the effects. Um, I'm sending a little bit of it, this channel right now, into effect two, which is our reverb, uh, which is delimited right here on the uh, green down here. Um, and we'll talk about the effects a little bit more, but this is how you can adjust how much of this channel specifically goes into that effect. There's multiple ways to adjust a lot of this stuff, including like the aux bus sends and the effects sends. This can be adjusted in other places as well on the software. Whatever works best for you for your workflow is uh, is good. The last section here, you have your assignment of your main out. You can take a channel and you can actually take this channel and bus it into something and then take that something and then bus it back to the main out. So you can actually deselect this channel from being in the main output. Uh, say you're using it as a 
gated reverb or something like that you're running in manually as an insert. Uh, there are reasons for that. You can select that here. You can also adjust your pan if you want to pan it left or right. You can also adjust your DCA groups, what's, uh, what's part of your DCA groups. Um, I probably won't go into what DCA groups are in this. Uh, that's one thing you can Google. You can look up YouTube of what DCAs are. But in essence, you can assign, say, if you had a drum kit on this mixer, uh, let's see, it's only a 16 channel, but if you had a drum kit on this mixer, uh, you could put all of the drum kit on one DCA, and then you can use that DCA to control the entire drum, drum kit's volume from one fader instead of having to adjust all the individual channels separately. That's a real quick and dirty overview. Um, and then, of course, you can assign your mute groups here as well. So staying on my main mic here, of course, all these tabs up here are going to be relevant to whatever channel I have selected for the most part. So the next one we'll go to is the input tab, which is actually going to correlate to what you see right here on the left-hand side of the input here, but it's a little more detailed. So we'll click on that. And here's the, uh, the details on the input side. So here's where I'll adjust my input gain, my mic gain. So if I have a, you know, obviously a hotter mic, you, you adjust your input gain down. You obviously don't want to peak. The left-hand side meter you see here is the input meter. So if you see it peaking here, it's, got, it's obviously peaking. You'll adjust your input gain to where this is right where you want it to be. You can flip your polarity, adjust your, turn it on or off your phantom power, and, of course, stereo link it here. Um, above here, you see the analog input. This, because it's digital... I can actually have channel one on my mixer that you see on the on the screen here. I can actually have that channel one be any input on the physical mixer itself. So if I if I wanted the actual in, input number twelve on the on the physical mixer, if I wanted it to be channel one on this this display here we're seeing, I can do that. I can just select it there, and uh, that'll be you know, input twelve. Um, Normally you wouldn't mess with that, but if you if you wanted to have a workflow where channel one was always one guy, but you never knew where he was going to be plugged in, you could, in theory, go through and uh, and make that change. You can adjust your low cut here. This is just a solid low cut. Uh, you can adjust the low cut in like four different places, but this is for cutting off any low rumbles and things like that out of your mics. Um, you can adjust the frequency there as well. And then the channel insert. We'll go over inserts and effects in a minute. But for now, the channel insert here, this is inserted on F effects one, side A. Uh, each effect is a stereo effect, so this is on side A for my dual de -esser. So the de -esser will uh, take off the, the high sibilance there. Um, so DBB Audio, Drew Brasher with DBB Audio, he has some really good YouTube videos on uh, all of the effects that are built into the X-Air series and the X-32 series. The X-32 series from Behringer is the same, uses the exact same effects as the X-Air series. The X-32 just has uh, eight effects slots as opposed to the four effects slots we have on these. Um, but for the U.S. price of 250 bucks, this is a heck of a mixer and, can, and it's pretty powerful. Um, so that's the dual de -esser. So we'll go up here to the gate tab here. This is our noise gate. It does have some presets in here, which is kind of nice. Um, if you don't know where to start off and, and you have this attached to a specific channel, you can use the presets. I'll go ahead and click, I'll load the vocal preset here. So what it's done is now it's turned the noise gate on, has created a threshold, adjusted the range. I'm gonna turn that down a little bit. This is probably a little grabby. Um, and then of course, adjust the, uh, uh, the ratio of what it is, is doing. So I'm going to turn it on to a full gate here. So obviously I'm not going to go into the details of exactly what a noise gate is. That's something you can look up on your own uh, when you have time. If somebody really wants a video about it, I can do a video about them. But for the most part, you have presets here. You can adjust these settings, your range here as well. You can adjust your full gain envelope here, your attack, hold, and release. Um, and of course you can side chain it. Uh, side chaining, you can either key it off of itself based on a frequency um, or you can actually key it off of another channel. So uh, I'm trying to think of an excellent way to describe this, but you can key this gate off of another channel. Say you have another microphone that's uh, picking up background stuff, uh, or you have like a, something that you only want to come through when a kick drum happens, you can key it off of a kick drum. So when the kick drum happens, it will open this gate. It's not going to be keyed off of itself. It's only going to open when the kick drum hits. You can do some cool stuff with that, but uh, side chaining is a, is a whole other whole nother thing. I feel like I keep saying that a lot. Um, next tab is our EQ. Uh, four band parametric EQ with a low cut here as well. This is all drag and droppable. Um, 
to turn our low cut on and off from here as well, adjust the frequency. One of the cool things about the EQs on the X-Air series is it does come with a full RTA. Uh, so I just turned the RTA on here and now you can see the full spectrum analysis of this mic that I'm using. Uh, you can see the fundamentals of my, my voice here. You can see everything that's going on. One of the things that can be really handy with this, these RTAs are for controlling feedback. So if you had feedback, you would see a specific uh, frequency here shoot way up and that would be the frequency you're hearing. So you can actually take that and you can take that and you can notch it out a little bit, you know, reduce the uh, uh, amount that that frequency is coming through. Or you can, uh, you can take your, uh, take each one here. I'm gonna take number two, run it up to quality nine. So it should be pretty, helped if I hit the right button here, make it nice and sharp. And I could cut, you know, a specific frequency out if I wanted to as well. So of course, standard EQ, parametric EQ, do whatever you want to with it. You can enable or disable bands as you please. Um, move things around. You can hear it probably maybe making a difference there as I sweep across. Um, boost, cut, whatever you need. Um, it also has, so right now, if I, if I make a change here, the RTA that we're seeing here is going to reflect exactly what the EQ has already done to it. So this is a, this is a post RTA right here right now. So this is not what's coming into the channel. This is actually what's coming out of that channel. We can hit the pre button over here and that will change it to a pre, uh, so as you can see before, like right now, I'm going to notch somewhere right in here. So with, this is the pre, this is actually what's coming into the mixer itself. So if I take this off and go to post, you'll see there's a little bit of a notch now here, right where I put this big dip in the EQ. So this is showing you it is reflecting, reflecting directly what, uh, what the EQ is doing. Um, of course you can go to a spectrograph as well. I don't find this very useful. It's easier to see with the standard RTA, but you have the spectrograph op option. Um, the next tab is the compression tab. So this is a standard compressor. You can do a lot of things with these. Of course, it does have basic presets as well. You have your uh, your threshold adjustment here. You'll see your actual amount of gain reduction here. Ratio, mix of how much of this compressor is actually mixed in. You don't. I mean, if you want to run just a little bit of compression in the background, you can you can bring the mix down, and it won't. Uh, be fully in there. Your makeup gain, of course you have your, your gain envelope with your attack hold and release here as well. You know, things like kick drums and stuff like that. You know, want an attack about 50, 60, somewhere in there to get that snap. Hold it for just a second and then a pretty slow release to control that real deep low frequencies. Uh, once again, you can side chain these compressors as well. Uh, I've done this with bass guitars and kick drums and stuff like that. I've had it so where it'll compress a bass guitar when a kick drum hits to let the kick drum come through a little bit harder things like that. You can key it off itself or you can key it off another channel, of course. Um, of course, linear and logarithmic uh, gain structures, peak and RMS, how the compressor works. Uh, all in there, you can adjust your knee. You can have a pretty pretty soft knee or pretty hard knee. Um, I'll take that one. I'm not going to do that while I'm trying to talk, but you can also turn it into an expander as well. Uh, broadcast things, stuff like that. Where expanders come into play really well. Um, so you can turn off the compressor right here as well, turn it on and off, enable, disable. Um, of course, what's coming in and what's going out. So if you compress a lot, you'll see your output here on one on the right-hand side go down. Yeah. Next tab is the sends tab. So this is uh, how we set up our effects sends or our auxiliary sends. So as you can see here, I have this channel because I am still selected on main mic here. Uh, bus one and two here. I have a little bit patched into bus one, so a little bit of this uh, audio that's coming in this mic is going to, is going right now to the aux one out. Um, this mixer only has two auxes, which is why you only see bus one and two here. Um, you can adjust here as well how much of this effect goes to the effects uh, reverb as on channel two, FX two here. So that's what you're seeing there. Um, and then of course how each of these channels are routed to the auxes. So these auxes, you can actually take the input of a mic and run it directly to an aux via the pickoff point here. Or you can have it be pre-EQ, which would be after your gain staging um, and low cut. Post-EQ, which will be you know, obviously after the EQ. Pre-fader, which is after EQ dynamics. Um, or post-fader, pre-fader, sorry, post-EQ dynamics, but irrelevant of the fader position. Post-fader, which would be actually relevant of the fader position that you see on the main mix. And then of course, subgroup. Um, if you're just, if you're using them as a, using that bus as a subgroup, 
um, to be patched back into the main for uh, essentially like a DCA, but a little bit different. You can process it separately. Um, and of course, how the effects are processed as well, whether or not they're pre-fader, post-fader for reverbs and stuff like that, we definitely want them to be post-fader. We don't want a set amount of reverb depending on uh, even if our faders all the way down or up because you don't want reverb coming through if your faders all the way down. So that's why it's set as it is. Effects one and four right now you're not going to see anything on because those are actually set up as inserts. And we'll talk about those when we get over to the uh, to the um, the effects stuff. Um, the right hand button here you'll see changes made or changes affect all channels. So if I change how bus one is uh, is set up here, whether or not it's pre EQ, post EQ, pre fader, that will affect all channels. If I don't want it to affect all channels, I'll just deselect this. Um, each channel can be done individually, but a lot of times when you're setting this kind of stuff, it's going to be globally, so that's why it gives you the global option there. The next tab is the main output tab. This is where you can assign your groups for DCAs, your mute groups, um, auto mix assignments, and weights for gain reduction. Uh, auto mix, if you're using this in a, uh, like a, a, a panel situation where you have like four mics and four people are sitting at a table in a panel, the auto mix basically will apply gain reduction to everybody but the person speaking. And so if the next person speaks up, then it'll it'll duck everybody else and let him go through. It just helps control noise a little bit better, but that's what it's for. Uh, you can adjust your pan left and right, and of course, if it is assigned to the main stereo out. So before I go into the effects and meters and stuff like that, I am going to click on my DJ input channels here. So I'm going to go back to the channel settings here. And I mentioned the stereo link earlier. So five and six are set for stereo link. So all it does is just help you it makes it a little bit easier on you. So with this stereo link, it automatically pans channel 5 to the left fully and channel 6 to the right fully. And we can see that uh, showing up here. We can actually go to the main output and see it a little bit bigger here. Basically, it pans them for you, and then it links everything together. So as you can see, my, my faders here are linked. So whatever I do on one channel, it's going to do on the other because it knows it is a it is one input source it's just a stereo source you can unlink that and do this stuff manually if you want but this just keeps it consistent and even it makes it nice if you have a stereo input it pans it for you it takes care of everything for you in that aspect um, the uh, equalizer compressor noise gate all of that stuff is jointly moved as well so if I if I make an EQ change on one channel, it will make that EQ change on the other channel for me. So it keeps everything everything together uh, as a stereo input. Um, if you're using a mixer that doesn't have a stereo input, like a, an older style mixer that just has four inputs and you're using DJ left and right on three and four, in theory you could have something different on channel three than you would on channel four. Uh, that's not always something you want. Typically it's not uh, something you want. So this just keeps things tight and clean. Um, so that was really it for the channels themselves. So we'll, we'll bump over here to the meter channel. Uh, so we'll keep this to where we're not getting too confused and keep things in an order. So here's our meter meter panel. This essentially shows all of the individual meters for everything. So here you see all the analog inputs, you know, one through 18 there. This is only a 12 channel mixer. This screen is meant for the larger XAR 18, which is why you see the full 18 channels there. Um, but you know, for example, this is only, this would only show up to 12, with these, which is your 12th input there. Um, just giving you a, a general idea of all of your inputs. So you can see if one specifically input is peaking, you can kind of keep an eye on everything. Uh, just standard meter bridge, effects sends, effects returns, your bus outputs, you can see everything uh, here as well. USB returns, this is only XR12, this does not have a full 18 USB returns, so obviously they would be all blank here, except for probably, I believe it's used on 1 and 2 from the USB flash drive that's on this thing. Uh, but if you were doing this uh, with an XR18, you'd see all 18 on the USB returns if you were returning. Uh, P16 Ultranet, this does not have Ultranet, uh, this model does not. The XR18 does, um, so you can't uh, you can't use an alternate system with this because it does not have the connectors for it. Um, and then, of course, your main outputs and of course your monitor or solo outputs here as well. My monitor solo output is on the same uh, is is linked to the main, so that's why it's exactly the same. Um, all right, so let's take a look at the effects that's the next tab over here so here are four effects and um 
you see I have channels one and four, effects, is, effects one and four, as inserts. So if you're not familiar with inserts, I'm not gonna go too much in depth with that, but basically I can take this effect and insert it directly into a channel, and I don't have to worry about yeah, getting levels right. It's, it's part of that channel then. Um, the first one I have here is my de -esser, and you can see it is patched in. You'll see it working on the right-hand side here. Um, this will take uh, off some of the sibilance that we have. As you see, my say sibilance really ramps up there. Um, I usually patch a de -esser onto my mic inputs if I have that option. Uh, it helps control sibilance, makes things not quite as harsh and so forth. But for the most part, as a general overview, I'm not going to go through the individual effects themselves because that's that takes way too much time. Um, you have I have a de-esser patched into one, which I have uh, inserted onto channels one and two. I have a vintage reverb. This reverb is not inserted so that I can I can run specific amounts of each channel to that reverb uh, in whatever ratios I want. Effects uh, three, I have a compressor in now. Effects three I don't typically use. Um, I can put like a, a mic delay unit in there, something like that. Um, yeah, like a three tap delay I'll put in there. And uh, I can then uh, adjust how much of my mics go to the delay if I wanted some delay uh, on my mic. And channel four I have inserted on my main left right out. I'm using this as a stereo bus compressor. Um, each, of the, each of these effects are stereo effects. So as you see this first one here, I say stereo, they're two channel. So the first effect here, uh, I can have an independent, two independent sources coming in and out of this compressor, or this de -esser, sorry. Um, right now my mic is on, well, it looks like it's on the right-hand side here. I could have another mic on this other side, and of course everything's independent. So that's how this works. Now, because they are two-channel, I can select a effect that is a stereo effect, where it only has one set of controls. For example, my stereo combinator here, or my reverb here, where it has one set of controls, and if it's a set as an insert, it will insert it onto left and right of, for example, here, the main left-right output. Um, so everything will be linked. You won't have individual controls for each side. But you can break this out to where everything can be independent uh, left and right sides. Um, so the, like I said, I could put two dual de up in here, and then I could, in theory, have all four mic inputs on a de if I wanted to work it that way. I would just insert uh, the effects too. I would insert that on channels three and four, and then my first four channels would all have a uh, de -esser patched into it. Um, like I said, I'm not gonna go into the details of these uh, these effects themselves, but this is a stereo combinator. It's a multi-band compressor. Um, I'm using that on my main bus out. It helps uh, give me a nice tight sound, helps me control a room, things like that. Uh, it's a pretty good multi-band compressor. I recommend it. Um, but there's tons of effects here. I mean, there's all kinds of them. graphic EQs you can patch in, uh, chorus, flangers, delays, uh, all kinds of different ones, all kinds of different compressors, uh, guitar amp emulators, tube emulators, pitch shifters, tons of stuff. Um, you can look up X32 effects on YouTube and you'll find tons of tutorials and all kinds of information on these effects. But this is... This is the four effects that I have set right now. Um, on the right-hand side here, we have a lot of stuff. We have our setup tab. This is where we can set up our network, uh, what mixer we're connected to with this software. Um, let's see, I am connected currently now. You can adjust your sync directions. You can Because in theory, you can get your software out of sync of your, your mixer. If for some reason you would get disconnected and uh, you make a change, they would be out of out of sync because the mixer wouldn't have gotten the instructions from your software. But the software doesn't know whether or not you're connected or not. Uh, well, I mean, it does, but it you can still make changes when it's not connected because the reason you can do that is so you can actually make up a mix ahead of time without being connected to the mixer, save it as a snapshot or on a flash drive, and you can take it to a venue and load it in. So you, you can do that. Um, you can manual IP it if you want, but it does auto search, so you can have it scan the network and it will find any XR mixers on the network. Really handy. Um, you can also, of course, initialize the uh, mixer, take it back to full defaults, and for, whatever reason, for whatever reason you'd want to do that. Second tab is the um, access point settings. So this is for the actual access Wi-Fi access point on the mixer itself. So uh, my SSID right now is just the the default. I do have a password on it. Um, 
you can only choose to have web security, but some security is better than no security. One of the disadvantages to these is it only has an 802.11g router in it. So if you have multiple people connected, actually maybe B, it doesn't need to be high speed for what it's doing, but um, it will, you can, you can connect more than one device at a time, but if you start getting like five, six devices connected to it, it will slow down. You'll notice some, some good bit of slowness using the built-in router. Um, so in the in just the case, because I know you know some phones will automatically connect to Wi-Fi, open Wi-Fi networks and stuff like that at, at at weddings and things like that. So I always set a password on mine. My password is one two three four five, um, but I always recommend setting a password on these um, to help avoid any uh, anybody accidentally connecting to it or something like that. Um, and of course, you can set your actual wireless channel here. Uh, I just use channel one. It's not the most common channel. Most common channel is channel six. I'd avoid channel six. Um, but you can look up, uh, you, they make scanners on phones and stuff like that. You can, you can scan a venue to see what the, what Wi-Fi channels are being used around the venue. And then, uh, you can select your channel, whichever one's not being used. So that, that exists. So the WLAN settings is for the actual Wi-Fi client portion of the, the built-in router into this X here setting. So in this case here, the SSID is my home network here. Um, you set up your password in here, you set up what kind of encryption it is. And so then when you turn the mixer on, this will then connect to the Wi-Fi uh, at your venue, at your house, at your, with whatever you have, your, your network you have locally. Um, of course, the switch has to be in the corresponding position on the mixer itself. Third is your LAN settings. Uh, this is for the actual network jack on it, which is what I'm using right now. Um, it does get an IP address just directly from the, uh, the DHCP server on your network. Um, simple easy um, this actually can be a DHCP server itself so say you just want to use a network switch and you don't want to have a router with you you can put this thing as a DHCP server and then you can have people connect directly to the switch if you have like a hardware network and you're doing it that way people can connect directly to that switch and this will assign them a DHCP IP address and then you can use the system obviously without an IP address things won't talk uh, the fourth tab, uh, one, two, three, four, five, fifth tab is our MIDI settings here. Uh, you can adjust your clock rates here. Um, there's some other audio settings in here as well. You can have it uh, mute the outputs at power cycle. So I typically have that selected. I don't have it selected right now. So what that means is whenever you turn this thing off, it actually happens when you turn it on, but as soon as you turn this thing on, what it's going to do is it's going to mute all of the outputs. What that'll do, that'll save you in an instance where you had you were using this last and you didn't turn down the outputs or the inputs, it didn't mute anything. Say you get to a venue, you plug everything in, your speakers are already on, you turn the mixer on, and then you have a microphone that's lying right in front of the speaker. It would cause feedback immediately. You could damage your equipment, you know, something like that. What this does is this mutes all those out all the outputs on the mixer itself, whenever it powers on or off, and. So you kick your mixer on, then it makes you get into the software and turn things down first before you unmute them. That keeps you from uh, uh, damaging your stuff. Um, also have how the mutes work, whether or not they work with DCA buttons. Uh, you can change it from being individual mutes to channel on buttons. So if you want default everything to be muted, you can turn it to channel on buttons and then you have to manually turn each channel on. That's kind of a personal preference, however you are used to working it. And then, of course, how the MIDI works uh, on the system. Sixth tab here is our monitor settings. So what this is for is for the actual headphone jack on the front of the unit itself. And you can choose what you want to monitor. So right now, I want to monitor the left-right post fader. So that's what you see here is left-right AFL, which is after fader listen. You can set it to be PFL for pre-fader listen. So no matter where your left-right uh, volume slider is, you would still hear everything that's being bussed to the main out. So it's just your preference of what you want to listen and monitor to. Um, you can change how the channel solos work, and then, of course, bus soloing as well. And then, of course, if you want to enable dimming, which will turn the turn the things down whenever you, everything else down whenever you uh, select the channel to solo or something like that. Last one is your GUI prefs. Um, perf however you want to set your settings on here, this is uh, this is all personal preferences, how solos work, how your faders move, 
the update rate. If you have a really slow network connection, you can actually change the update rate to be half of what it is now, so it's a little bit less on the network. Um, you can also change things to always be on top window-wise. Uh, and of course, you can have the buses set to show bus names. Um, I usually have it selected, I didn't right now. Next is the in and out. This is our routing settings. So of course you can change routing in a lot of different places, but this right here will show you exactly what channel is routed to what analog, or what, sorry, I flipped that backwards. What analog input is routed to what channel? Obviously, basics, defaults, you know, channel one is, input one is routed to channel one, two, two, three, three, et cetera. All the way down through here for all 12 inputs. Obviously, this is only a 12 channel mixer, so 13 through 16 is disabled. They are off. Uh, but those 13 through 16, those channels exist in the mixer. So in theory, I can take channel 13 and I can make that analog input one as well. So now analog input one is actually being routed to both channel one and channel 13. Uh, channel 13 is down, so I'll move my window up here and you can see it. So now my input here on one is also on channel 13. Um, this could be handy for a lot of different reasons, but for the most part, the nicest thing about that is if you want to take a signal and have it go multiple places in your mixer for processing reasons or whatever, you can do that. Um, I don't remember how to deselect this, so I'll have to look at it later. I'll just leave it on right now. Oh, off. Sorry. Woo. Brain fart. So now, like you see, down the bottom 13, you don't see any signal coming into it anymore. So you can adjust that. Auxiliary outputs. Here's where you can uh, you can change how each of these auxiliary outputs work and, of course, how the auxes are set up. Right now, I have buses 1 and 2 set for auxiliary outputs 1 and 2. That makes sense to me. Uh, that's how I operate it. I know, you know, bus 1 is the aux 1 on the unit itself. I can change that around. I can actually take auxes 1 and 2 and make them the main left-right outputs if I wanted to. Um, you just have the ability with this. And, of course, you can change how each of these buses or, or your aux outs, how they, uh, how they work, whether or not they're just an analog off the inputs or whether or not they're post fader, you know, whatever. Um, you know, with this, I could actually take auxiliary one and make it a direct loop through the input one here directly to the aux out one. Why I would do that, I'm not 100% sure. Um, you would essentially have a DI at that point. You'd be taking a, a mic level and taking it to a line level, but... Um, you can do it if you want to. Last one is the main out. You can adjust here once again how your headphones or your main out are set up. This is much larger on the bigger mixers like the XR18. Next tab is the utility. Here's where you can actually pull up uh, RTAs, buses, DCAs, and then of course user, uh, user creatable groups. And these are, I can pull up the RTA here, and it's literally going to be the RTA for whatever I have selected here. So if I have channel five selected, I'm gonna select channel one. Hey, look, there's my RTA. Um, I can also change it to spectrograph, um, pre-EQ, post-EQ, however it's done, peak, pre-post, peak RMS, whatever. Um, you can adjust all this stuff in through here. Uh, next one, you have save, load, copy, and paste. These are for the global settings, so I can actually save um, Save this whole everything here as a scene or a channel preset. I can you know, select. I can create channel presets for each of these channels, and of course, save them off as well. I can load them in as well. I can copy. I can paste them, etc. Uh, the next tab is the snapshot tab. I showed you that already. You can save snapshots. These snapshots are saved within the mixer themselves. So you, in, sorry, within the mixer itself. Um, I believe you can have up to sixty-four snapshots. Um, that's pretty hefty. I typically only use like one or two snapshots under, under a normal basis. Um, I'll overwrite some, and sometimes I'll do custom events that I may come back to later in the year or something like that. I'll save a snapshot. That way when I get there, I don't have to recreate the wheel you know, with this mixer. The next tab is the recorder tab. So right now, I don't have any flash drive inserted into it. Um, do I have one handy? I do. So this is the USB recorder. This is... Um, what you see on the front USB port. So if I plug a USB drive in here, which I'll do right now, you see it populated everything on this flash drive. Just as a, as a precaution with this, the flash drives have to be formatted in a FAT32 format. Uh, you can't use an NTFS format flash drive with this. It will only work with FAT32. Um, and then what you can do is right now I can hit the record. I can select how I want to record this, first of all. 
Right now I have it set for main left to right, so it's going to record my main output and it's recording it pre-fader. So say I'm at a venue that has, uh, where I, or I might need to ride the main output control. I don't want to record what I'm, where my volume level is on the main output. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, because if I'm at a venue, I need to turn things down. I'll just turn the main output down. You know, every venue is going to be a little bit differently. And I don't want my, rec I don't want my recording to be, uh, relevant of where my main output is. So I always have it set for pre-fader, but literally I can hit the record button and it's going to start recording. You see right here, it has Cray populated a file name. That's what the file name is going to be on the, on the, uh, mixer itself. Um, and of course I can close this, close this window out and it's going to sit here and it's going to record. Uh, you can see it recording up here on the right-hand side as well. You have some basic track controls here for that. Um, so if you need to stop the recording, you just hit stop. Um, when you play back, I'm actually going to turn the channel down here before I do this so it doesn't come through. Um, I'll leave that up a little bit. So you could, when you play back from the the, the flash drive, uh, it will come back through our aux channel here. Now this aux has, of course, uh, EQ settings that you can adjust, but it does not have compressor, gate, uh, or any kind of other settings. It's literally just a, a return is all it is. Um, so I will select that. Um, I guess you can do some EQ on it. That's kind of nice. Um, and I can select my whatever one. As you can see, I have a lot. I record a lot on this thing. So I can hit the play button. And it's going to start recording. And it will play back what I had recorded through that aux channel. As I'm sure you heard, um, and so that's that's your that's your stereo recorder. That, the recorder is really nice. So I've actually done this at a lot of uh, wedding ceremonies with the business. The you know, the officiant and the groom are on the first two channels. Um, I can actually record them independently if I want to. And my recorder here, I can take this and I can set my recorder to uh, record you know, channel one and channel two. Uh, so the first two channels now will be routed to each side of this recorder. As you can see right now, only the left side's working because I'm only on channel one with my mic. Uh, so if I want to record each person individually and then you process it later, I can do that. Um, but if I want to grab like uh, computer audio or you know, background audio, stuff like that, um, I'll usually do either a bus record or a main, excuse me, main record as well, main out record. So you have that ability. <clears throat> <coughs> so the next tab here is our, our main output. So our main output has, of course, an equalizer, compressor, um, as well. Uh, we can hit the EQ button here. On our, on our main outputs, so of course our main out or our monitor, our, our aux outs, they have a six-band parametric EQ. Uh, you get a little more control with that. Or you have the option on these channels to switch over to graphic EQ. Um, I'm going to reset this because that might sound like crap. Um, so here's our full 31 band graphic EQ. Um, you can overlay the RTA with it as well. So of course, good for finding feedback, things like that. Um, so if you don't want a parametric EQ on the master out, if you're used to having a graphic EQ like in your rack or something like that, here you go. You have your graphic, uh, graphic EQ. You can sit here and change what you need to. Um, of course, it also has the true EQ uh, frequency list down at the bottom, as expected. Um, I prefer the parametric EQ. It depends on what I'm doing. Uh, if I want to make subtle room changes and stuff like that, I can make room changes here on the parametric pretty easy, or I can do them with the graphic. You know, it depends on what you're used to and what you like. Um, you also have compression. You can compress your main bus out. So you know, if you want to tighten up your sound, you want to make things a little more controlled, uh, you can compress your master bus kind of melds things together, keeps it a little bit tighter. I'm already using a compressor on the main output. While I have it enabled, it is set at zero, uh, basically with 100% ratio. So this, essentially this would just prevent my main output bus from distorting. So that's our main out. Um, I have the gain envelope set to auto on this. You can set gain envelopes on these to auto time and it will automatically adjust your attack hold and release this for you. Um, it, it, it works, it works pretty well, but if you like your control, of course you can just deselect that. Um, so now we'll take a look at some of the other controls we have here on the right hand lower side. Um, so as you see here, I have selected main left right. So all these meters through here, 
uh, as I adjust these, these are going to correspond directly to the main output level. So if I take my mic here up or down, that would be how much of that is in the, the main output. So say you want to adjust your mo so you want to adjust one of the auxiliary outputs. Um, I have mine named monitor one and monitor two. You can name them yourself. Uh, I'll click over here to monitor one. So what this basically has allowed right here is the premise of sends on fader. If you're familiar with some of the X32 consoles or any of the other major digital consoles, you typically have a sends on fader. So you can hit this button, and this right here that you see in yellow is the mix of what is going out of auxiliary two. This is not what's going out of the main output. This is this has nothing to do with the main output. I could sit here and move this all day, and it wouldn't have anything to do with the main output. And for example, I'll go ahead and take my mic here. I'll bring it up, bring it down. As you can see, it had no effect on the main output. My audio is still being recorded. Um, so you can adjust uh, adjust exactly what's happening on that monitor output from right here. Uh, the monitor outputs themselves, of course, have EQ as well. Um, full graphic EQ or six band uh, parametric EQ. So each output itself has controls. And I'm actually compressing the output as well. You can compress your auxiliary outputs. So say you have monitors on this thing, uh, a set of monitors for your DJ setup. You could uh, you, you can add compression to those monitors. It won't affect anything on the main output. This is completely independent of the main, and only that output will then be compressed, uh, just like your main bus compressor. Um, and of course, you can set your EQ settings as well. So you're having feedback on your monitors. You can you can uh, flip over to graphic. You can notch out a frequency. Um, and you can control it all. That same goes with the second bus here. Uh, you see all the stuff down here. I'm gonna actually color code these different, uh, make it a little easier to see here. I'll take this one light blue. Um, so now my monitor one and monitor two are two different colors here, so I can know exactly where I'm at. My main left right is gonna be gray automatically, and I can select this. If I see all this yellow, I know I'm in the monitor one mix, so I can sit here and make adjustments, and this is what, this is gonna make adjustments to the, the monitor one mix and not the main outs. The main outs is separate. Of course, your total volume for that monitor mix is set right here. So, same with the uh, monitor two. Uh, bring it up. Now you would have that second aux out. You know, working with my mic here. So there's there's that. A bus three, four, five, and six are not used on this machine. Uh, you can take these buses and then you can patch these buses back to the main out. Um, which is what they are right now. They're bus to the main output. So if I would add something here. Um, Actually, that's going to get confusing if I do that. Uh, I can bust something in here, and then it will loop back to the main output. Um, you can compress it, do whatever you want to with it that way. And then down below here are your effects. Now, these are now going to be your sends on fader for your effects. So right here I have effect 2, which is my reverb. I don't have it named. I can name it if I want right here. I can color it if I want. Uh, help keep track of everything. Um, and now the... Uh, I have just a little bit of this in, in here. So my, I'm returning, effects 2 is now returned to the main, so that's how it's coming back through. I can bring this up and then boom, 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 bring it back down. Um, you can adjust how much of these, each channel goes into the reverb. Same with the delay. Uh, channels 1 and 3, you can make all changes in here you want, but it's not going to make a difference because these are set up for insert, uh, which is what's selected here. So it won't make any difference of what I select down here. So other than that, that's a that's a pretty rough overview of the uh, the Xair mixer. Um, like I said, I use this for weddings. I use this for all kinds of different events. Uh, it's small. It's compact. It's very handy, and it's cheap. I mean, you get all this power, all these effects, all this control, compression on each channel, EQ on each channel, and it, not just like a high and low EQ. You get a full parametric EQ, adjustable Q of different of each band. You know, you get all this control, which I guess some people don't want. You know, some people don't want all that complexity and, uh, and, and junk with it. But for me, being an audio guy and, and, and being in this stuff for so long, I like having all this control. I like having all this stuff. Uh, it allows me to take my events and, and make them just that much better, you know, for, for everything. Uh, so I, I hope this was informative. Um, if you guys have any questions about this, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, this, I mean, this can do a lot. It's very convenient. Um, and uh, I hope you guys will, uh, 
we'll elevate your events and uh, and dive into one of these as well. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoy. And as always, like and subscribe.